Mm-hmm. So the opportunity for ASEAN to continue to build its resilience is not only very much needed, mm-hmm. but I think it's a great opportunity that we have to seize. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the ASEAN podcast on the ASEAN Prize series. My name is Romeo Arca Jr and I'm the Head of Community Relations Division at the ASEAN Secretariat. Together, we will dive into a discussion week and discover the ASEAN Prize recipients, their life stories, their journey, and their perspectives. In this episode, we are delighted to have a conversation with the ASEAN Prize 2019 recipient, Dr. Jamila Mamoud from Malaysia. She is the founder of a Malaysia-based international NGO, Mercy Malaysia. Dr. Jamila received a prestigious regional award in 2019 for her commendable and outstanding achievement in the humanitarian field. She is a humanitarian leader and specialist who has led humanitarian emergency responses and served marginalized communities within and beyond the region. After serving as the Under Secretary General for Partnerships at the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Dr. Jamila is now back in her home country of Malaysia. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Jamila. Good morning, Dr. Jamila. I'm really very honored to have this conversation with you. How are you, Dr. Jamila? I'm well, uh, you know, we are living in times of COVID, so things are always challenging right now, but I have good health and I'm, uh, you know, I'm grateful for that. Uh, very good to hear that, Dr. Janila. Um, well, in this, in this uh, podcast, we're actually going to hear about you, you know, your life story and, you know, how you ended up becoming the Asen Prize recipient. And I'm sure that, you know, before you received this prestigious award, a lot of people already know you, but I think when you became the Asen Prize recipient, a lot more Asen citizens got to know you. And I think one of their questions, you know, in their, in their mind is, uh, how did she become the Asen Prize recipient? So could you tell us a bit, before Dr. Jamila became Dr. Jamila, you know, who, who, who is Jamila, you know, before that? So what was it like growing up in your family when you were young, Dr. Jamila? Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I'm really humbled uh, to be the ASEAN Prize recipient and, uh, you know, to be able to share my journey. I'm Malaysian. Uh, I'm of mixed parentage. I have uh, a Chinese mother and a Malay father. So I grew up in an environment of diversity. Um, And I think from a very young age, I was brought up to uh, really care for other people's needs. And I was in a uh, Catholic missionary school that really, um, you know, upheld values of charity and kindness. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of my formative years, whether at home or in school, has always been molded around, you know, uh, service. So, um, you know, it was therefore uh, in my journey through life, uh, I was exposed to either through my parents or school. Uh, to be of service to others. Uh, I lost my father very young. I was 11 years old and, um, you know, my mother had to go to work uh, to take care of all of us. So uh, that also gave me additional exposure to, you know, supporting her and seeing how she worked as a woman who had very little education but was extremely entrepreneurial uh, and seeing how hard work uh, pays off. And I think that, has been a great influence in my life that if you want something, you have to work very hard mm. and be, remain honest and truthful and, and, and carry on. So um, I entered a career in medicine. Uh, I became not just a doctor, I also became an obstetrician and gynecologist. Mm. And, you know, I could have remained in my medical career and, uh, you know, remain as a successful uh, 
you know, position, so to speak. <clears throat> but for me, it wasn't enough. You know, I looked around and um, I reminded myself that my choice of doing medicine was really, again, you know, that journey of service. So I was very, very disturbed by the fact that humanitarian assistance and development assistance is quite colonial. And it's quite interesting that now, today, if you look into social media and the dialogues around the world, there's a very strong push for decolonization of aid. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think way back in 1998, when I started to really think about, you know, why is it that when I turn on the television in any form of crisis, it's never an Asian face, never someone who looks like me, Never someone who comes from the global south that is seen to lead or be involved in providing assistance to you know their citizens, mm -hmm. um, and there was there was hardly any sort of uh, organization in the region that was doing that. And I tried to reach out to some of the existing you know traditional organizations in the region, but. I think people didn't understand or perhaps at that time couldn't fathom how, you know, someone from the global south could actually do work like this. And that prompted me to establish an organization called Mercy Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And Mercy Malaysia was really born out of, you know, a deep sense of responsibility and frustration as well. Okay. That, um, you know, why is it that myself, I speak for myself as a Malaysian, uh, you know, living in you know, relative comfort and mm -hmm. peace. Um, why do we measure development by growth and yeah. GDP yeah. and high buildings? It should be more than that. Yeah. For me, development yeah. is about the ability to think beyond yourself, you know, and the solidarity that you have with, with others. And when I started, I didn't imagine that you know, there would be like-minded people like me who would, you know, I, I knew there would be, but I didn't imagine how many there would be. Yeah. And yeah. very quickly, um, you know, we grew our volunteer base, you know, to almost 5,000, uh, mm -hmm. not with, without much difficulty, to be honest. Um, and that was the birth of us in Malaysia that, you know, started to work in Kosovo, in Afghanistan, in Sudan, yeah. in Iraq, you know, Indonesia, Philippines, Cambodia, not Myanmar, all around the region as well. And I think um, it has proven to be a role model for an inspiration, I would say, for organizations in the global south yeah. to take charge. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jamila. Um, how, is that how is that transition like for you? Because you said, you know, you're a medical doctor, you're an obstetrician, gynecologist, and then just now you said you ventured into humanitarian work. Um, yeah. how, is the, how is the transition for you? Was it an easy one, you know, from being in the operating, you know, table, delivering babies, and now doing, you know, some real work on the ground? Um, yeah. Describe to us that transition for you. I don't think it was very difficult because my experience in medicine has ranged from emergency medicine to, uh, you know, anesthesia to surgery to obstetrics and gynecology. And, you know, when I started Mercy Malaysia and I started to do work in the... Um, in the uh, in the humanitarian sector, I was still able to apply my medical knowledge because Mercy Malaysia's focus was always on health in emergencies mm. and public health in emergencies. So I think it was it was quite a natural transition to speak, except that you know you you're seeing people who not only you know have lost so much, but may also be in a very poor state of health to begin with. So I had to very quickly, you know, ramp up my knowledge and my skills on public health in emergencies because it was beyond clinical health because you're treating communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would say it wasn't that difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jamila. So far, what has been the most uh, challenging experience for you? You've coordinated a lot of humanitarian, you know, responses, assistance during your time, you know, with Mercy Malaysia, but also with, I think, IFRC. So what yes. do you consider as the most challenging experience for you? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think I've been doing coordination work with also the United Nations, which has been uh, really quite the bulk of the coordination work that I've done uh, part of the UN disaster team. And I think the biggest challenges we face is that in the crisis situation, there is chaos and there is a multitude of actors. Um, and most of the time, uh, so a lot of these actors are flown in from other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And the challenge of trying to get people to really appreciate local talent, local culture and context, and really, you know, find the, a, a way to balance power mm -hmm. uh, amidst the crisis response. Because the biggest challenge we face in major crises and in major response is the power imbalance that exists because of the international aid that's coming in versus the national and local capacity that's there. So it's very easily overrun and you know not seen to be a great asset uh, in managing crisis. So I think I've been a, a very loud and vocal champion of what is termed broadly as you know support to local action and leadership. Um, and you know it, it's something that is the elephant in the room. So you know we've been pushing and pushing, not just me, a lot of people. Uh, and I think it has started to take shape that people are recognizing the decolonization of assistance and aid is, is going to be crucial. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jamila, you're an obstetrician gynecologist, and mm -hmm. uh, you know into humanitarian work. Um, would you say that women are affected differently by humanitarian you know, situations or is it the same for everyone in the community? Uh, absolutely. Women are more severely impacted in any kind of circumstance, whether it is crisis or development. I don't just do crime humanitarian work just to, just to clarify. I also do quite a lot of development, long-term work. Uh, disaster risk reduction, health health pre pre prevention and health security. So uh, most of the time, women to start with, you know, generally live, especially in countries where I've worked, you know, where are, you know, they are either conflict uh, affected or, you know, less developed and, you know, have lower socioeconomic uh, indicators. Women are already, you know, marginalized, so to speak. Uh, they are strong, they have amazing strengths and amazing cap capacities, but often not given that space to exert their leadership. <clears throat> and in addition, the, the cultural norms sometimes <clears throat> really make it difficult for, for women uh, to gain access. I'll give you an example of, for example, you know, getting women to uh, have safe access to health or um, to water sanitation facilities. Yeah. If they have to walk a long time and a, a long distance to get water and other amenities, they may be attacked uh, along the way. So <laughs> women are exposed to gender-based violence yeah. um, and discrimination as well. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing up, you know, the gender perspective in, in all of these issues, Dr. Jamila. So let's try to bring the conversation closer to home now. Um, why do you think um, is humanitarian assistance vital for, you know, the regional development of ASEAN? Yeah, well, the Asia Pacific region, of course, ASEAN forms a large bulk of the Asia Pacific region, is undoubtedly the most disaster prone region of the world. Mm. It's also the region that's also quite severely impacted by the consequences of climate change. And as we have also seen, the region that is also vulnerable to pandemics and other high health crises. You know, if you are going to develop, you have to make sure that your gains are not eroded by the constant need to respond to crises. So therefore building resilience yeah. of ASEAN communities and, uh, is extremely important. So, you know, yet, you know, the field of humanitarianism in, in the region, as we know it by Western descriptions, is fairly new. Yeah. But um, we know as well that traditionally in this region, the spirit of giving and cooperation uh, and with, with strong governments, I would say, that actually lead most of the response is, has always been there. 
-hmm. So the opportunity for ASEAN to continue to build its resilience is not only very much needed, mm -hmm. but I think it's a great opportunity that we have to seize. Yeah, that's, that's right, Dr. Jamila. Now, um, unfortunately, all of these natural disasters don't stop just because we have COVID, right? Um, so how is humanitarian work on the ground being impacted by this global COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yeah. Because there had been some typhoons, some storms yeah. that, has that have happened in the region. So how is this affecting, you know, our our people, our, our, our population? Yeah, that's a really important question. First of all, let me uh, put one um, factual uh, matter on the table. There is no such thing as a natural disaster. There are natural hazards, earthquakes, heavy rain and so forth. But disasters are really a correlation between hazard and vulnerability. Therefore, if you can reduce vulnerability, you can actually reduce the risk of disasters. So disasters are never natural. Most of the time, they are mm -hmm. a result of the interaction between natural hazards and our um, inability to reduce vulnerability. So let's put that straight. Now, as we face a COVID pandemic, you know, we cannot stop typhoons and floods. And we certainly in Malaysia also have experienced some flooding last year. Yep. So I think that um, these are the huge challenges. And we've also seen now, you know, even political instability uh, and security issues in the region as well. So one of the challenges then will be, you know, what are the resources that are available that can actually deal with this? And again, I come back to the, this, this, this very important role of local and national leadership. Mm. Um, because ASEAN has invested in the last, you know, I would say in the last decade, uh, and maybe last 10, 20 years, uh, with the establishment of the ASEAN Humanitarian Assistance and Coordinating Center, the AHA Center, I think that investment is very important because now national governments have, you know, some resources and capacity to do that. Civil society is now brought in as partners. And therefore, when a calamity hits a, a country or a region or a district, there are mechanisms that can be employed. The challenge then is how do you make sure that in your response to a crisis or a disaster, you do not exacerbate the spread of disease? So this comes back to my whole you know, notion of resilience for the, for the region, and that must require a multi-stakeholder, multi-hazard, multi-crisis approach. So the health sector cannot be isolated from other sectors. And certainly the disaster, man manage disaster management agencies and organizations that work in disaster management need to also look at you know, how uh, do they interact with the health communities, for example. Um, and I think this has provided a huge opportunity to relook at whatever policies that are available and how do you make them interoperable with other crises that may occur at the same time? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm really struck by what you said just now, Dr. Jamila, that there really aren't, you know, natural disasters, but it's yeah. really, you know, um, that there are risks, yeah, but uh, the situation is exacerbated by, you know, either our lack of in the lack of our ability to respond, you know, and to all of those uh, situations. And so- uh, I think it's not just response. I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't think response, I mean, response is a given. If you have a crisis, you respond. It's our, our lack of ability to prevent. To prevent. This is more important, right? Response is, uh, is I, would, I would use the word very sexy, it's easy. When there's a crisis, Everybody wants to respond, but not when, when the crisis is over, people don't invest. And this is something very important for the region, which, which is very disaster prone and very you know, prone to all sorts of risks, mm. that you have to invest in prevention and resilience. So to give you, a, you know, an analogy, earthquakes don't kill, unsafe buildings do. 
So if you look at Japan and some parts of the other parts of the world that are earthquake prone, you don't see the number of deaths because their buildings are safe. They are yeah. they are retrofitted to be safe, right? If you know an area is prone to flooding, then if you don't build in mechanisms to prevent that flooding or to move people to higher ground uh, to prevent them from being hit by a tsunami, then those lives will not be lost. So, you know, the natural hazard will carry on. You cannot stop nature, yes. uh, but you can prevent and reduce vulnerability. Mm -hmm. That's a really important thing, Dr. Jamila, the point about prevention. And, and I'm glad you brought it up because for ordinary people like us, you know, these things you know, are somewhat, you know, hidden, but now we're, ha we're glad that you, you brought that up. So uh, the importance of prevention, uh, because response will come in, you know, uh, as, part of, as part of the spectrum, you know. Yeah. Um, but, but it's good you brought up uh, the point about prevention. So we're, we're about to, you know, wind up this conversation. So I just now would like to ask one more question for you. And I'd like to bring us back to, you know, why we're having this conversation. Um, you, you, you have received, you know, this prestigious award, the Ascent Prize. So we're, we're just interested to know how has the prize impacted your work thus far? Um, or how has it impacted, you think, the field of humanitarian work in our region? Well, first of all, I'm very grateful and honored for the prize. And I think that, um, you know, I, I really salute uh, the ASEAN leadership uh, to even think about setting up a prize and the donors who put uh, the money in. Because I think the ASEAN uh, community needs to be inspired, right? Needs to have... Um, different role models, uh, so to speak, and that they can look up to and be confident that the region does have expertise and does have, you know, individuals or organizations that can actually um, help and support other organizations or develop leadership in the region. For me, uh, when I received the prize in 2019, end of 2019, you know, I wish I can do more. First of all, you know, uh, the honor and recognition is there. And I hope that people living in ASEAN know that, you know, an ASEAN citizen can make a huge difference, you know, to, to the world. But, um, but I think that more can be done. I think that uh, I would be happy to play a role to maybe encourage the younger generation to be a mentor to other ASEAN organizations or individuals to be able to exchange knowledge uh, similarly with you know, institutions and uh, leadership in the region. And I think that we need to create, um, you know, this kind of community of practice among those in the region that have that, you know, expertise and knowledge and whatever experience um, you know, I'm very grateful. I have more than 20 years of experience working in crisis uh, around the world. And there's so much that you learn just through experience that no textbook can teach you. And I think that, you know, it's very important to impart that knowledge to the region as well. You mentioned the younger generation, Dr. Jamila. So for your final words, what would you say, you know, to the young people out there who are listening to this podcast or are watching these on YouTube? Um, what would you like to tell them, the young people of ASEAN? The first thing I would say is this pandemic will end one day. And that, you know, no matter how you're feeling right now, I can only imagine young people feeling very sad about the situation. I want them to feel there is hope. And I think the pandemic has is a wake up call for every single one of us. Uh, it didn't happen in a vacuum. It is because you know we have really violated our planetary health boundaries. We've damaged the environment. We have, you know, we've done so much to the planet that has caused us to have more diseases and more crises and climate change and all that. But the younger generation who is listening, you are our hope, right? We have to work together with you because. I am so confident that, you know, young people today have gone through so much and will have the solutions for tomorrow. So, you know, stay strong, you know, 
inspire us, uh, the older generation, and know that you know every problem you know has a solution if we find and you know look deep enough. And it begins with individuals, and then create that circle of influence around you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamila, for your insights and for stoking hope. You know, I really, I really want to hear positive messages these days. Uh, so yeah. thank you, you know, for, for um, inspiring us uh, and for sharing your, you know, thoughts to all of us. Thank you for your thank time, you. Dr. Jamila. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Jamila. Bye-bye. That was a very insightful discussion with Dr. Jamila Mahmood, the Asin Prize recipient for 2019. I hope you're all inspired and thank you for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to the Asin Podcast and stay tuned for our latest updates on the Asin Prize.